for those of you who are regulars, you know that there is a topic um, we did as a Lenten series a few years ago that I will circle back to occasionally. And here it is again, the seven deadly sins. I just, I, I really do like it. I find it a, an effective schemata for considering what's wrong with our world and, and how the wrongness of the world is not a problem out there alone, but a problem in here, in our own souls and hearts as well. I think it's a practice in honesty and humility to consider where the seven deadly sins come to play in our own psyches and in our own lives. And this morning, they, I, I think they're an interesting counter, um, kind of anti-beatitude, you might say, to Jesus' beatitude teachings. As he begins his Sermon on the Mount with this list of what it means to be blessed in the eyes of God, which is quite different from what it means to be blessed in the eyes of this world or this culture. So we'll consider the seven Beatitudes here and what we might call this morning the seven anti-Beatitudes, the seven blessings and the countervailing seven curses. And then at the risk of oversimplifying a bit, we'll have two paths to choose from. Okay, so, so we'll begin by remembering that, that one of the essential aspects of our being and surviving as human is the fact that we desire. It's essential to our humanness is our desire. We are not just human beings, we are human desirings, right? We could not survive without that desire. Where sin enters the equation is when our desire becomes torqued, or as St. Augustine referred to it, incurvatus in se, turned in on oneself. The mythic image of this is in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve desire that which God says don't eat and their desire gets the best of them and they chow down on the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And anyone among us who has been a child or a teenager knows the truth of that story. It is true that being told no only increases our desire for it, right? But it's when our desire becomes turned inward and focused on ourselves rather than outward towards God, that's where sin enters the equation. You know, I mean, inward, outward, this, this is all metaphorical language because God's within as well, I, I, I would say. But for the notion of, of, of being curved in on oneself as opposed to curved outwards towards the world and one another, um, we'll, we'll stick with that language. So. So the seven beatitudes of Jesus are exactly the, the opposite of being curved in on oneself. Blessed are those who either turn outward toward God intentionally or their circumstances have turned them out towards God. The poor in spirit, the mourning, the mournful, and the meek. The first three Beatitudes are conditions that tend to lead people into a state where they are more dependent upon God's presence and God's grace. The pursuit of righteousness, of right action, merciful actions, maintaining a purity of heart and peacemaking are intentions or efforts that also turn us outward toward God, not so much seeking our own gain as the gain of all that surrounds us. So they track pretty well, I found, the seven Beatitudes and the seven sins. So let's dig in one by one, and we start with Jesus' teaching, blessed are the poor in spirit. All right, it's, it's the Gospel of Luke. It's interesting um, that the Gospel of Matthew says poor in spirit because the Gospel of Luke, as you might have noticed or noted, it says blessed are the poor, period, while Matthew says blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, but whether we are experiencing a poverty outwardly or inwardly, the effect can be the same. Blessed are those who are poor and know their need of God. That's from the New Living Translation of, of, of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are poor and know their need of God. Or blessed are those whose poverty drives them towards God. 
The opposite, the deadly sin, is when our natural human desires drive us not towards greater dependence on God, but towards greed, a grabbing, grasping, hoarding, where our gain comes at the expense of others. It tends to be part of the name of the game in our economy, but in God's economy it's different. Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. While others are vying for the kingdom of this world, theirs is the kingdom of God. He says all of these concisely as he could, powerful kind of mm, punchy short sentences that I'm ruining by speaking for 20 minutes on them, but go read them yourself again. He says these so concisely and moves into the next one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So what is the deadly sin opposite of the way of mourning is the way of gluttony, where the painful, empty hole in us, you might say, due to loss or failure or anxiety or fear, we try to fill with whatever we can get our hands on, drugs or alcohol, food, shopping, work information, social media, entertainment, whatever that thing is that does a pretty good job numbing us to the emptiness, that helps us avoid the pain and what needs to be mourned in us and in the world. That's the nature of gluttony. The novelist Peter DeVries says, gluttony is an emotional escape, a sign that something is eating us. Nice turn of phrase. Gluttony is an emotional escape, a sign that something is eating us. And so Jesus teaches us quite simply, blessed are those who mourn, who sit in the emptiness, the sorrow, the grief, and wail for themselves and for the world in all of its suffering instead of covering it over with fluff and chemicals and plastic and busyness. With all that, there is no space, no time, no humility there to allow oneself to be comforted. That's, that's the key, which is what a mourning person in a mourning world needs. They need comfort, not for their problems to be fixed or solved or satiated, but simply comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, or as the, the message translation of the Bible from Eugene Peterson. He translates that line in this way. Blessed are you when you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. The third blessing. Jesus teaches, blessed are the meek, the humble, for they will inherit the earth. So obviously, the anti-beatitude it's what they call the deadliest sin of them all, pride, which is essentially the turning away from our higher power or God, our God, because we got this. We know better. My power is the only power that matters, and the self is exalted by way of the diminishment of others. It's probably the one thing that makes Jesus the most furious in the Gospels. Not your everyday run-of-the-mill sinner, not even extreme sinners, but the prideful religious people who elevate themselves, who preach from a tall pulpit. <laughs> I realize the irony of saying this. <laughs> the, the, um, but the prideful religious people who elevate themselves and denigrate others in the name of God and religion. That's, it infuriates him. It infuriates him. And all these years later, we still haven't come out from under this one. Blessed are the humble is what Jesus teaches. Blessed are the humble. How do we be humble in our lives? The writer Frederick Buechner says this of humility. It doesn't consist in thinking ill of yourself, but not thinking of yourself much differently from the way you'd be apt to think of anyone else. It is the capacity for being no more or no, and no less pleased when you play your own hand well as when your opponents do or your enemies do. Jesus says, blessed are the humble, the meek, 
and then hands them everything, for they will inherit the earth. The proud, you might say, will destroy the earth, while the humble inherit it as an heir and a steward of what is ultimately God's. The fourth blessing. If you count the Beatitudes, blessed are, you might notice that there are actually eight of them, but for our meditation purposes, I am combining the fourth and the eighth because I think they're both about pursuing what is right and just no matter the consequences, those kind of hold together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and are even persecuted in that pursuit, for they will be satisfied and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So the opposite of this beatitude is a doozy. All right, The opposite of this beatitude, this deadly sin, is what they consider the second most deadly of the sins, just behind pride, and that is the sin of sloth. It's a doozy of a sin because, especially in our culture, it's so easy to think it doesn't apply to us. I work hard, so sloth is not my issue. Ask anyone how they are doing, and the answer is likely going to be, I'm just crazy busy right now, and I find myself doing that. And it's a justification of myself. I'm just crazy busy. Things are so crazy busy right now. It might be true with how we've designed our lives that we are crazy busy, but it also gives away what is a core sin of our culture, and that is that we work ourselves into worthiness. If we are not busy, then somehow we are not worth anything, so many of us believe. But busyness and slothfulness are not opposites. The opposite of the sloth The opposite of the slothful person is the person who hungers and thirsts for what is right and good and true and will pursue it even at the cost to themselves. The sin of sloth is the sin of not caring because we are too tired with our busy lives to care or because someone else will deal with it or because we are too comfortable to care about the uncomfortable. We are too entertained or numbed out to find within ourselves the energy to get up and fight for justice, especially when we are not victims of it. That's the sin of sloth. Sloth says, eh, whatever, in the face of injustice. Or I just don't have time. I just don't have time. I heard it said during the pandemic that the only reason so many people poured out into the streets for Black Lives Matter protests was because they were bored and sick of being at home. (laughs) Exactly. When we allow ourselves some space and time and boredom to sit still for even a little while, we are likely going to be a whole lot more apt to care, to get out into the streets and care. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and even are persecuted for it, for they will be filled. Blessed are the Iranian protesters who aren't numbed out to care too much. Blessed are the people in the streets of Memphis. The fifth beatitude teaching of Jesus is blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And Maggie's good. Maggie's good. Her, you know, quick response to what is mercy? Forgiveness. The nature of mercy is that you necessarily show it to someone who doesn't deserve it. That's the nature of mercy. Built into the concept of mercy is guilt. The person is deserving of punishment and strict justice, but Jesus teaches that blessed are not those exacting justice or punishment, but those who show mercy. For he says they will be shown mercy. The deadly sins are the great equalizer because we all fall under their spell. Some of us favor one of those seven more than others. Or with our various personality types, we tend towards one of the seven, but we all have a bit of it all in us. Right? We are all guilty because we all sin, and since we all desire to be shown mercy for the ways we fail, we must show mercy to others. 
the anti-beatitude here that lurks in the background of this one is envy, where we want for ourselves what we see others have. Your gain is somehow my loss. Your loss or misfortune is somehow my gain and fortune, and so the curving in on ourselves, right? You just, the envy is such a powerful, kind of the green envy of turning in on oneself. Showing mercy and thereby receiving mercy is exactly the opposite movement. This where the other's gain is my gain and the other's loss is my loss and we reverse that movement and turn outward towards God and others. Blessed are the merciful. The sixth beatitude is blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure. But you can guess what the anti-beatitude here is. The seven deadly, one of the deadlies. Um, blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus teaches, for they will see God. Or as the message translates it, blessed are you when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right, then you will be able to see God in the outside world. And the opposing deadly sin that accompanies purity of heart would be lust. Notice the passage does not say blessed are the pure in body. Jesus takes issue with this time and again with those who maintain a strict purity code externally without tending to the inner realities of pride, greed, lust, sloth, envy that are denied or hidden by the outer presence of a pure life. Jesus so often goes to the jugular right, and says, no, blessed are the pure in heart, not just those living a pure outward life, but pure inwardly is the key, getting your mind and heart put right, not lusting after what will gain you power and privilege and pleasure, but seeking that which brings deeper relationship and union and wholeness. That's how lust breaks down the, the, the wholeness of our relationships. It's about what I can get from the other for my own pleasure. Lust is the devouring and subsuming of the other into my needs and wants, which blinds me to the true other and to the true God. Purity of heart is finding the proper relationship to the other, which even means at times that I must diminish in order for you to flourish. And such right relationship helps us, as Jesus teaches, to see God seeking that right relationship. And finally, Jesus teaches, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Not the competitors and fighters and winners being blessed, but the peacemakers. The way the message translates this is, is, is in this way. Blessed are those who can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. The anti-beatitude is clear, drawing us away from this teaching, this reality is the deadly sin of wrath or anger or vengeance. Anger that leads to wrath and vengeance. Just as built into the concept of mercy is guilt, built into the concept of being a peacemaker is conflict. We are peacekeepers, we are peacekeepers if we are maintaining the status quo of no conflict, and that might not be for the best. But we are peacemakers when we are entering into a conflicted situation and hewing out of it, again at times at the expense of ourselves, hewing out of it peace for me and the other, for us together. That's where the rubber meets the road, especially when we are treated unjustly, when we are furious with the other, when we want vengeance for what was done to us or another. That's when we are called away from the deadly sin of wrath to be a maker of peace. The pathway to flourishing is peacemaking. And our wrath and anger that leads to vengeance in however small or subtle a way is the pathway to diminishment. And that's what 
essentially the Beatitudes are the pathway towards flourishing, the pathway to a happy life to some extent, but maybe not always happy. Jesus would, was happy and joyful, but Jesus had his fair share of sorrows and sufferings. The Beatitudes are seeking that deeper reality of God's, God's love and God's presence. Jesus' Beatitudes, poverty of spirit, mourning, humility, the pursuit of righteousness, merciful actions, maintaining a purity of heart, peacemaking, they're the pathway to our and the world's flourishing. And the seven deadly sins are the pathway to ours and the world's diminishment, if not destruction. And our work as a community, as people of faith on this journey that we're on, is to just maybe try to just move the needle a little bit in each of these instances towards that which is humble and not prideful, towards that which is, which is celebrating of the other instead of envious of them towards that which is, which is a state of a, of, of a purer heart where we can choose peace in a moment when we could so easily be violent in our thoughts and our actions and our words. May God lead us in the way of the Beatitudes and may we support one another in, in our efforts to follow that way, that truth and that life. In the spirit and power of our risen Lord, amen.